This is a drone, and this is a guy who failed his FAA Part 107 exam and then passed it with flying colors two weeks later. So I have a really interesting experience and I'm gonna share some gems with you so that you can pass on your first try. And if you fail the exam, then you can know what to do to pass on your second try. So here we go. I run a company that deals with marketing for a lot of clients in various industries and I work as a photographer and videographer during the day. And I had a gig where I could use some aerial footage and so I bought the DJI Mavic Air Zoom and I literally learned a couple of days before this planned gig that I need to have a special license in order to do anything commerce related with drones. So I went and I studied for about four to five hours, skimmed through the study guide that they provide you, and I didn't take the practice exam. I just went ahead and I watched a few Tony Northrup videos and better B-roll videos while I was driving to the center actually. And uh, I showed up, it took me a full two hours to take the entire exam. And I tried as best I could, and I'm pretty good at standardized tests. I finished at the top of my class in college, grad school, high school. So I feel like I'm pretty good and proficient at scoring high on exams like this. I failed. I got a 67, and you need a 70 in order to pass. I fell short by two questions, and it hurt. It was like getting rejected by a beautiful girl. However, because I took the exam and failed it, I had some insights and some knowledge as far as what type of questions they ask and how to better study for the exam. So in two weeks, I studied about one chapter a day, probably dedicated an hour each day, and I ended up getting an 88. I just passed the exam yesterday, and so while it's fresh in my mind, I wanted to kind of give an updated video and also give you some insights on how a retake test looks and how similar they are. So before I continue, there's three things you have to do in order to get a good score on this exam. Go through their study guide, read it and really understand it. And I'm going to point out the sections that you really need to know and the sections you could kind of skim through and be somewhat acquainted with. And then the next thing you want to do, take the practice exam and read through the rationale of the answers. That'll be super helpful. They are somewhat similar to the exam itself. And then the third thing you must do is look at the couple of videos I'm going to link in the description. These were a lifesaver. They were super helpful, not only to clear up some of this content, but also a friendly way of explaining some of the answers and giving input and insights into the exam itself. Before I jump into the content, I do want to point out that the first test and the second test were very different for me. When I took the first one and I failed it, I kind of jotted down right after the test some of the questions that were on it because I wanted to go and research the answers to it and be more comfortable the next time I came in and took the exam. However, it was like taking a completely different exam. It's almost like they have an algorithm where they know the questions and the sections you got wrong and right on the first exam and they tailor the subsequent exams to that. So they want to test you on the knowledge that you got wrong because I definitely found the second exam to be more tricky and difficult than the first exam, even though I scored an 88. So without further ado, let me get into the content. Okay, so if you have the study guide open, I'm gonna go through it and kinda let you know what's really important and some of the stuff that you can skim through. I'm also gonna point out some of the charts and some of the information that you should study right before the exam or make a note of it so that you can put it in your short-term memory because it's a lot to remember and if you glance at it right before the exam, it's gonna be super helpful because you'll be able to understand and know that information and retrieve it from your memory during the test. So the first thing is chapter one. Now this is funny because when I originally took the first exam, I didn't even look at chapter one because I printed out my study guide. Make sure you click on these links. The 14 CFR part 107, you gotta read the entire thing. It's not a long read, and that's about three to five questions on both exams right off the bat. You need to know that stuff. Pay attention to the numbers and the rules. Now, AC 107-2, it's a little bit more of a dry read, and it's got some legal language in it. It's kind of, it reads like a legal document. I didn't pay as much attention to it, but I did skim through it, and there was probably one to three questions from there also on both exams. 
Chapter two, airspace classification is a common theme here. Now, they're not gonna show you this chart and ask you questions about it, but they are gonna ask you a bunch of questions on class B airspace, class C airspace, class E airspace. You need to understand the differences between controlled and uncontrolled airspaces. You need to know about some of the common above ground level numbers associated with them. Now, they're gonna ask you to look at sectional charts and figure out what the floor and the ceiling is of some of these airspace classifications and you have to understand how to do that. That's the stuff where it could say 40 over SFC and you know that that's surface level and the 40 you sometimes have to add the two zeros to it. Make sure that you go through this material and read chapter 2 very very carefully and understand the difference between special use airspaces, restricted areas, prohibited areas. This is all on the exam. Also, they're going to ask you to identify the prohibited and restricted areas. And now is a good time to mention that when you get the book in the legend section of the book, and you can even go through the book before you start the exam because it's there. You can ask them if you can have a couple of minutes. Go through the legend. A lot of the answers are going to be in the legend. I would say six to eight answers on both exams were right in the legend. It'll ask you, what does this mean? Or what does this color circle mean? You could find all that stuff out in the legend. If you forgot what a restricted area looks like, simply look at the legend, find what the restricted markings are. So please remember to go through the legend, whether it's before the exam or during the exam. Also important to note, when they ask you questions on sectional charts like this, make sure that you look at the chart itself. It is helpful to be familiar with what a sectional chart looks like. You don't want to come in there and not know anything. That's what I did on the first exam. I would definitely go through the practice questions, look into it and see. Like even here, you see there's these symbols and there's numbers underneath. Some are in parentheses, some aren't. You have to understand the difference between that. Be familiar when they show you airport and they have like CTAF and they got all these numbers. You have to know which number means what. Again, it's helpful to look back at the legend and figure it out, but it's also useful to know it beforehand. Another thing that they ask you about, so military operation areas, MOAs, was a theme on both of the exams. Other airspace areas, I didn't see too much about it. I don't remember receiving a question about it actually. Notice to airmen, you need to know the sections. The NOTEM is, again, it was on both exams, and I would definitely read through it and be familiar why they put out NOTAMs and what NOTAMs look like. Chapter three, aviation weather sources. Fun, fun, fun. So this section is a bit of a dry read because honestly, you're not gonna read this too much in real life. You're not gonna go look at METAR reports. You're probably gonna be using an app on your phone. However, you do need to be super familiar with exactly what all of this means to the point where you can take this sample line and read out exactly what it's saying. The time, the type of message, the wind direction, the knots, the gusts, how much visibility, statue miles of visibility, thunderstorms, rain. You need to know some of these abbreviations, mist, that the clouds are broken. So definitely go through this chapter and Tony Northrut does a pretty good job explaining this but I would go even a little more in depth and make sure that you understand this section really well. Now, figure 3-1 is something you might wanna look at right before the exam and really familiarize yourself with these abbreviations because they do show up. Another important thing to note is you gotta know what these are. So these are the qualifiers where the plus means heavy. So if it says rain and there's plus, that means they're heavy rain. If it says thunderstorms and there's a negative, that means light thunderstorms. VC is in the vicinity. Sky conditions, definitely know that overcast and broken, what the sky cover is and the contraction abbreviations. They will appear on the exam for sure. Chapter 3B is interesting. I must say these questions were quite difficult. This was kind of like a physics exam in high school. So just remember that high density altitude is high altitude and low density altitude is low altitude and understand the different conditions and the effects that pressure, temperature, and humidity have on density. And this includes the dew point, 
This is something that I kind of skimmed through because I dedicated myself to certain sections and I knew them in and out and some other sections I just skimmed through and I was a little bit familiar with it and I said either I'll figure it out on the exam or I won't. Remember, you only need a 70 which means you could get 18 questions wrong. That's a huge gap that they give you um, but don't be mistaken, the exam is definitely difficult. So you also need to remember uh, measurements of atmospheric pressure. I would read through this. Again, don't be too crazy if you don't understand all the ins and outs of it. Wind shear was a common theme on there. And also make sure you understand what a front is. Atmospheric stability, there was questions on inversion. So I would read through that section as well. There were some dew point questions and frost questions. And interestingly enough, these questions were difficult on the exam that I took where when I went afterwards and I read through it, I still wasn't sure what the answer is, but I would definitely familiarize yourself with it. Now the clouds, this is not a section that you could simply read through and be like, okay, I read this section, I'm ready for the exam. You gotta know this stuff really well. This is like three to five questions. And you have to absolutely know the different names of the clouds, what they mean, and definitely memorize this chart. This is not something you wanna memorize right before the exam, you wanna have this in your knowledge so that you can make sense of it on the exam itself. Unstable air, what you need to know is that there's turbulence, it's rough air. However, there's good visibility, showery precipitation, and cumuliform clouds. Stable air is fair to poor visibility, and in the exams they just refer to it as poor visibility. So remember, poor visibility is stable air. And it might seem like an oxymoron, but it makes sense because the air is smooth and if there's fog, it's kind of consistent throughout. It's stable air. There's continuous precipitation rather than showery precipitation and it's stratiform clouds and again, fog. So also do pay attention to mountain flying. There was a tricky question with regards to what to look out for when flying mountain shears and stuff like that. Thunderstorm life cycles is also something that you need to understand. Now, they're not gonna ask you super, super specific stuff. However, you should know that the clouds, they're usually flat, and then once the heat and the temperatures kind of expand the clouds, that's when they could form into the mature stage, and then in the dissipating stage, that's when the rain comes down and it kind of dissipates and things get broken up. But this is something that you want to understand, definitely understand the ceiling, and visibility. Chapter four, small unmanned aircraft loading. Again, we get to the physics stuff of it. Now, you're not, in the real world, you're not really gonna have to know all of this when you're flying a quadcopter. However, this is an exam on theory, and so it makes sense that it's in here. And a lot of it is about center gravity. Some of it is common sense. One thing that you do want to be familiar with is load factors. You want to know how to read this chart. You want to understand that if you have to make a 60 degree bank turn, you know how to find what the load factor is and then you multiply that by the weight of the aircraft that you're flying. Now, it's also important to mention that you should know what stall is and you definitely need to know the effects of weight and that excessive weight has these things to look out for because this is a theme on both exams for sure. Chapter five, emergency procedures. This is something that you do want to read and the one thing to keep in mind, and there are rules like how much money, if there's damage, do you have to report to the FAA and stuff like that. But there are some questions that try to trip you up and say that when do you have to report to the FAA? And the answer is upon the request of the FAA. So for instance, if you go above 400 feet, which you're not supposed to fly, but let's say there was an emergency and you had to get away from the rules and you had to fly up to 500 feet in order to not crash into something, you don't have to contact the FAA and write them. And I think the reason they ask a couple of questions saying that wait for the FAA to contact you and that's when you have to give them the information is because they kept getting people that were writing them and hammering them and they just couldn't deal with the load of different information they were getting. So they said, okay, let's make sure this is on the exam so people know that if they 
go around the rules. They don't have to write us about everything. They only have to report it to us upon request. But they do ask a couple of questions like that. And you'll notice that some of the questions are kind of repeats. Like they try to hammer down uh, certain things and they ask like two or three questions back to back that the answer is very similar. Um, so chapter seven, radio communication procedures. This is interesting. They want you to be able to speak like a pilot and know the telephony, phonic pronunciations. I mean, just go through this list and if you go through it once, you'll be fairly familiar with it. There's no reason to go through it a ton of times. One thing that you definitely need to know is 122.9 and that's the multicom frequency, but you need to understand when you should listen into the common traffic advisory frequency. CTAF, that's gonna be like three to four questions. They're gonna have you look at a sectional chart and you could see this in the practice exam where they say, okay, there's a non-towered airport that you'll be flying near and where should you call in? Which radio tower or which frequency should you listen into? And these can get a little bit tricky. So make sure you read this very carefully and you understand it in and out. And when you take the practice exam, make sure that you understand those questions dealing with this because these appeared on both exams as well. Chapter eight is again, it's getting into the physics of things. So you have to know that increasing temperature uh, decreases density, decreasing temperature can increase density. And so it's something that I didn't, again, spend too much time on. I kind of read through it and I said, I get the basics of it and I'll let it fly on the test. And I did all right on those questions. Chapter nine is something you don't want to skim through. This is something you want to read every single sentence and make sure that it's ingrained and you understand it. And one of the reasons is because this is actually an easy chapter to read through. And some of the other chapters, like the ones on load factor and density and all that stuff, they can be tricky. However, these questions are straightforward, but you do need to know the different figures and the stuff that they're talking about here. And so this chapter I read like two or three times and I comfortably answered the questions that were very easy to answer. Now you do have to understand this exam is really tricky. They try to throw answers in there. There are common sense answers that sound correct. However, it's not in the material. A lot of times the answer that makes a lot of sense, that's the one you want to choose, but choose the answer that you read about because that's going to be the correct one. And they do that so that people don't do what I did, which is just be smart, walk in there and think, you know, oh, I'm cocky. I could, I could get this right on the first shot. Make sure you read this vision and flight section. They do ask the question of how you should scan and what the scanning technique is. And just understand that they want you to look at a section of the sky for a short period of time, then look at another section, then look here, then look here. They do talk about degrees, 30 degrees, 10 degrees. So you should know that and read it carefully and be familiar with it. Chapter 10, ADM and judgment is like, they apparently put a ton of resources into studying this and creating this. And they ask maybe six questions on it, also on both exams. And so you really need to know the section. The good news is that it's easy to read. Now there's a lot of acronyms and they talk about a lot of things that might sound elementary to you, like common sense, why do I need to memorize this? But again, they probably put a lot of funds and resources into creating this. They want you to know it. So definitely look through the steps of good decision making, the risk management, actually read the rationale for why they have these things. Crew resource management is going to be a couple of questions. They do ask you about single pilot resource management as well. This chart might sound silly and you might want to just glance through it, but know it because it's two questions on both exams, at least it was for me. So something like anti-authority, don't tell me. So they'll, they'll do something where they'll tell you, you got hired to inspect a remote tower and they told you to just go do it. And what type of behavior is this? Or what is the antidote to this type of behavior? And you'll see similar questions in the practice exam. And they do ask you this type of stuff. So macho, resignation, and vulnerability, impulsivity, and anti-authority. Make sure that you know these five hazardous attitudes and the antidote thinking and approach to curtail these types of hazardous attitudes 
that they want you to identify. Be familiar with the PAVE checklist for sure. Understand what the acronyms stand for. Human factors, so they definitely want to remind you that humans are the primary contributor to aircraft accidents. I think they say like 70% is due to human error. And again, this is based on research and they want you to understand that you have a lot to do with the outcome. This isn't just the drone is expensive and uh, you know nothing's gonna happen because you know how to work the app. There is a lot of stuff that can happen and you need to use decision-making process and apply it correctly to whatever you'll be doing. The 3P model and the 5P model was a question, so definitely be familiar with that. Now, this aeronautical decision-making chart, I remember seeing it. I did not know the decide model, and I just kind of skipped through this stuff because I read the rest of the chapter. Operational pitfalls is something you want to concentrate on, and again, this is so easy to look through and read through. I mean, it's there's, there's a lot of them listed, but it's easy to understand, and you want to focus on a lot of stuff here that's easy to understand because it's easy to get it wrong on the exam versus some of the other stuff like pressure, density, and all that jazz. Stress management is also appeared on both exams and they talk about the different stressors, the situational awareness, and you definitely wanna go through that section. Again, it's all common sense. Airport operations. First of all, one thing to mention, you do wanna know the difference between civil and public UAS. That was a common theme on both exams. Now for airport operations, this is something that I'm gonna go back to the CTAF and knowing which tower to contact and what happens if it's a non-towered and when to use a multi-com, unicom, why different pilots use it, NOTAMs, definitely understand that. Chart Supplements US is also a common thing they ask and that's something that they want you to know that the most comprehensive detailed information is not in the sectional charts, even though that's crazy detailed, it's in the chart supplements US. And they also want you to understand what the automated terminal information service is, what the notice to airmen is, and all that stuff. So definitely look through it. Figure 11-1 is an example of a chart supplement, and it will be helpful even though it's in the legend. So you'll see something like this in the legend, but you want, might wanna take a glance at it. It'll save you some time because there are questions on reading stuff off of a chart supplement US. Sectional charts is interesting because some of the stuff they had me look at, especially on the first exam, I could barely see it. I asked them for like a magnifying lens. I don't know if you could bring your own, but if you have bad vision, make sure you're wearing your contacts or your glasses that day because it is really difficult to see some of this stuff. And the other thing is they're gonna ask you sometimes to look at a certain area and find a certain icon or find a tower or find an airport. Now, sometimes they're not even close to that number. So don't be alarmed if they're saying, look at area three and you can't find it. Just expand your search a little bit and your radius of searching and you'll be able to find it. And definitely understand what these different colored circles mean and the dashed lines and how to find, again, the floors and the ceilings of certain air spaces. Now, a lot of the stuff that I was saying, like there's three to five questions on this, three to four questions on that, they sometimes integrate it into sectional charts and they ask you it by way of sectional chart. Definitely know how to read longitude and latitude on a map and find certain things if they give you the latitude and longitude point and they're perpendicular lines and if they give you certain numbers you'll be able to line it up and they'll say like which longitude and latitude is this airport or something and you'll be able to link them up. So definitely understand how to use longitude and latitude. I didn't really get anything about magnetic variation and ton of towers. Okay, so I know you might have watched this video and been like, I just listened to everything and you didn't really give me concrete stuff, so I don't understand the point of this video. But what I was trying to do is that, again, there's really good videos out there and I don't want to overlap them. I'm, not, I'm also not a fan of creating content that's already out there and does a pretty good job. Again, this study guide, like if I scroll all the way to the top, I believe it says, August 2016, which is crazy that they didn't update it. And the videos that were put out was like three, four years ago, and it seems to still hold up. But I will say, definitely you do need to look through the content and give this exam the respect that it deserves. I hope this helps. Let me know in the comments section how you did. And another reason I wanted to put out this video 
is because I failed the exam. I've never failed a certification exam ever. And I feel that sometimes people get disenchanted or they feel like they're losers or they feel like negative emotions, they don't wanna retake it. And I'm here to tell you, it's fine. Like I shrugged it off in half an hour, I studied, I passed, and I'm thankful I did. And it's okay to fail even twice, three times. I actually know someone that had to take it eight times. And on their eighth time, they passed with a good score and they probably know more about all the drone regulations and stuff after taking it eight times than I do. So not everyone passes on the first time and if you go through the threads and you listen to the stuff they share on Reddit and the YouTube comments, they make it seem like this is an easy exam and I'm really smart and it's easy to pass. It's a difficult exam. You're hearing this from a person who's good at these types of exams and I can tell you this was a difficult exam and even on the second time I broke a bit of a sweat but it's behind me and now I'm gonna put out good, good footage and cool stuff so if you want follow the channel subscribe there's a lot of different videos a lot of content I put out if you're an entrepreneur you're gonna love it if you're an investor you're gonna love it and also if you're a fan of drone stuff I'm definitely gonna put out more videos and hopefully really cool drone footage that I'm able to get in the future do yourself a favor once you pass the exam, you gotta go and celebrate, baby! Woo!